Good. So Ray, why don't we start with, uh, let's just start with a little bit of your background. Um, so the listeners can uh, get to know you a little bit. Where, where did you grow up? I was born in uh, Nancy Cook, Pennsylvania. It's a small coal mining town, uh, kind of up in the Northeast, not too far from Scranton. And I guess everybody knows Scranton since our uh, president raises his, his background up quite a bit. And uh, dad was a coal miner and uh, that was pretty much what everybody was back in those, in those days and times and particularly in that area. And uh, of course, this was uh, in uh, and around the, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, World War II was uh, going on, and uh, Dad saw some opportunities down in uh, Baltimore. He went down there and got a job, and uh, the family uh, followed him later. So most of, uh, I think I was uh, about six years old when we uh, moved uh, down to Baltimore and uh, it worked out great because uh, Baltimore, Maryland was uh, a, a good town to grow up in. I was uh, very fortunate uh, in the uh, schooling that I had there. Uh, the high school, which was the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, was uh, rated every year in the top 10 high schools in the United States. And from there, I just went down the street a little ways to the uh, Johns Hopkins University. And they, they did the best they could to give me an education, but I, I, I was resisting it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Were you more interested in something else? Uh, yes, you might say so. I, and and I, I blame it on things like when I'm a little... I started working when I was about eight or nine years old. And uh, this was uh, shining shoes or helping my brother, older brother with uh, his paper route or a job he had in a grocery store. And uh, I, was, I was the number two guy, he was the number one guy. And uh, then uh, I went on to have uh, a paper route and of my own and uh, I was working pretty much every day after school. And even in the, in the summer, I was, uh, instead of serving newspapers, I was in the uh, newspaper office as a copy boy. And that was, uh, that was pretty interesting and loved it. But uh, again, I, you know, I just didn't have any time to play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so when I got into college, you know, it was okay. When you don't have to work. This was uh, the guidance from my mom and dad. You don't have to work. Just devote all your time to study. And uh, with all the freedom I had, I misused it. <laughs> hmm. So uh, that's that's how uh, that's how things got started. And then. Uh, what did you study at Johns Hopkins? Well, it was uh, mostly industrial engineering. And the reason I was in the engineering school, which wasn't my natural proclivity, my dad worked in uh, the shipyards and uh, he was a uh, pipe fitter. He traded the coal dust of uh, the mines up in Pennsylvania for all that... Uh, all that does not dust, but the uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Of, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the what they wrap the pipes in. Mm. Was the John uh, a blank? Anyway, uh, he saw all these men walking around with clipboards and uh, hard hats and they were engineers and they weren't working as hard as he was. Mm -hmm. He thought, that's what I want for my boy. And so uh, when I went there, there was no doubt what I was, what school I was gonna go into as an engineering school. 
I see. And the fact that Baltimore Polytechnic High School I was talking about was uh, an engineering high school. And you could go after gradu graduating from Poly, you could go into the second year, sophomore year, and, and many of the uh, engineering college courses. So did your father manage to avoid World War II, it sounds like? Well, he was in the war-related uh, industry. Mm. Uh, they were building Liberty ships in the uh, key highway section of Bethlehem Steel there in Baltimore. And uh, so he, that, was, that was his contribution. Mm-hmm. To, to the war effort, and they turned out a lot of Liberty ships. It's amazing what they uh, what they did down there on those docks. And uh, I'd go sometimes for days without seeing my father because he was working uh, double shifts day after day, you know, seven days a week. He worked he worked doubles. Uh, I'd be in uh, I'd be in school when when he was in bed and. He was only getting, you know, five and six hours a night. It was pretty rough, pretty rough. But uh, he still said it, it was nothing compared to the coal mines. Sure. Yeah. Well, so how did you get how, how did you get from Johns Hopkins uh, into into the military? My government insisted on it. <laughs> they uh, they sent me my notice and, and I answered the call. And what year was that, Ray? 58. 58. So yeah. you were drafted in 58. Drafted in 58, right. Had you finished John Hop Johns Hopkins at that point? No, 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 no. It was uh, third year, actually. And uh, like I said, you know, I wasn't uh, winning any trophies for best student of the year or anything like that. And I don't know whether that had any anything with anything to do with my being drafted or not, as far as numbers and all that's concerned. I can't recall. But uh, me and 50 others uh, at Fort Hollenberg in Baltimore got on a train and went down to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to uh, the reception center there and, and began the in, in processing to uh, make us all soldiers. Hmm. And, and you had not you had not completed your college education at that point. That's that's uh, that's correct. Officially that's correct. Okay. So you were processed in as a as an enlisted person. Uh-oh. Hold on, Ray. Everything froze up at your end there. Hold on just a second. Okay, you're back now. So you you processed in at Fort Jackson uh, as an enlisted man? That's correct, yeah. And uh, I don't know if I told you uh, about this before, but... And... Yeah, okay. Looks like all right, looks like we're still recording. I'm not sure what's going on. All of a sudden, my internet connection is unstable. It never fails. I have a stable internet connection all week long. And as soon as I get on a Zoom call with somebody, it starts uh, it starts acting up. So you were explaining, um, I had asked you about being drafted into the Army as an enlisted man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, at, the re at the reception center, you're supposed to get all of your initial issue. That's all your clothing and equipment. And the basics that you need to get on to uh, wherever you're going to take basic training. And uh, one of the uh, physical problems that I have been born with are very long arms. And the uh, class A uniforms that they had available, at least the blouse, the blouses, and then the the Ike jacket was, which was still uh, in use back in those days. Uh, all the arms were, were too short. So they said that uh, they were going to have to order me a, a, a tailored shirt and, and jacket, and I was going to have to stay there. And I said, what do you mean stay here? He said, well, these other 50 guys are going down to Fort Benning, 
to uh, take basic training. And this is one of the things that uh, when I was putting this, this little uh, thing that we're doing here together, uh, kind, of, kind of struck me and it, and it has before. Uh, so many times uh, throughout my, my career, something happens, unusual circumstances happen that got me going down a course that I had not intended and uh, I, I had no no control over over the matter, and this this was one of the first one. I guess the first one was when I got drafted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> had no control. Over that. that was a kind of an all of a sudden thing, uh, which altered the way my life was going. Certainly, uh, and the uh, the greetings came in just after we we were making our initial plans for our marriage. Uh, and that was uh, that was the same girl that uh, was helping us get started here <laughs> a while ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we uh, I, I was there standing on the platform waving goodbye to all all my newfound friends, and then went uh, went back and eventually I was taking uh, basic training there at, uh, at at Fort Jackson. A couple of odd things that. That happened there. One was uh, my name was called out in formation one day. Told to re report to the uh, to the orderly room. Went down there and there was a uh, a small van alongside the building. I said, "Get in that van. Uh, they're going to take you over to for some further testing." The van went to some uh, place on. Fort Jackson, is, they had some old World War II barracks buildings there. Went in, went in there and there were uh, two guys. Uh, one was uh, in uniform, the other was in civilian clothes. And they gave us, it was a small group, it was about 12 of us, I guess. And uh, they gave us uh, some more testing. And it was kind of, uh, well, it was English and spelling and you know, kind of an intelligence test of sorts, I, I guess. And then uh, we passed those papers in, and the next day they said, okay, report to the early room. Went through that same routine again. We got down to the old barracks building, and they said, uh, okay, we want you to write a, a, a paper, or so many words about some current event. And I didn't know what the hell was going on in the world. But uh, I wrote something about the United Nations. Uh, I think I think that's what it was. And then the next time uh, we went down to that building, the the uh, two guys that were running the show uh, started asking questions about everything that we had written. And uh, in other words, you had to defend your position or paper. And so I went went through that. Got, and each day there was some weeding out it got down to me and another guy and i said okay uh we're interested in you you two individuals having uh, a possible career in military intelligence and uh at, at the time uh i had also uh put in for ocs and uh i had passed the uh the the, the initial board on that so I was, I was waiting for the word back on that as to whether or not I was going to be accepted. But i had been told that I probably didn't have anything to worry about. And uh, so I thought military intelligence, that'd be, you know, pretty interesting. And uh, that's a possibility. But when I asked him about, you know, how soon would I be able to go to OCS? And there was a lot of humma humma about that. It was, uh, they, they couldn't guarantee anything. So. I said, well, count me out because uh, that <laughs> that was going to be uh, the thing that was contingent on whether or not I was going to be able to get married because uh, I didn't think we were going to be able to make it on that 90 bucks a month <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that I was going to get as a, uh, as a PFC. And uh, 
And the other, the other big thing that came out of that course was that uh, I was eventually accepted into OCS, went to, finally got down to Benning uh, to take my uh, six month infantry, infantry course on how to be uh, an infantry platoon leader. And uh, then another one of those things happened. Another one of those things being the things I didn't have control over. And uh, out of a class of uh, something like 100, it was just under under 200, I guess. We started out with about 230, 240 in the class at OCS. And that got whittled down eventually with people drop, dropping out and, uh, for various reasons. And the uh, final count was somewhere around 150 of us. And out of that 150 at graduation, there were five of us that uh, were going to Fort Bragg. And all, all the others, as far as I know, were going to do what they thought they were going to do when they got into OCS infantry. They were going to become infantry platoon, platoon leaders, which is what I thought I was going to do. And uh, I was going to be very happy doing that. But as it turned out, like so many other things, uh, I was down a different road, that road being uh, the Special Warfare Center at Fort, Fort Bragg. And uh, I was in the first loudspeaker and leaflet company, first radio broadcasting and leaflet battalion, which was a mouthful. And, and uh, down the street from where we lived were uh, the special forces folks. And then there were some uh, civil affairs folks. And that's what eventually made up uh, special operations the special operations that we are familiar with today. Mm. Mm -hmm. And can you just give us a little bit of, uh, you know, for listeners who aren't, who aren't familiar with PSYOP, can you just give us kind of a, just a very brief, broad overview of what it is, how it had been used uh, in, in the American military prior to Vietnam, and then, you know, how it evolved and was used in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, you, you want the book? <laughs> no, we don't. We're already 30. We're already 30 minutes in, which means we're 20, we're, we're 20, we're 25 minutes behind. So yeah, just, uh, you know, if you had to explain it to somebody in an elevator, what is PSYOP and, um, and how had it been used, uh, in the military, uh, up, up until the point that you, that you got involved? Well, as, as far as uh, what it is, it's, uh, it's an attempt to uh, change people's opinions, their attitudes, not, th not their beliefs necessarily, but uh, their, their conduct and their thinking. And, and this is done through uh, persuasion, which has got uh, a lot of uh, potential outlets like the uh, the printed word, radio broadcasts, uh, videos, and of course the standard uh, leaflets that uh, were put out by the hundreds of millions in uh, in Vietnam. Uh, as far as uh, what was in the army before before Vietnam? Uh, Psyops suffered the same uh, inattention after uh, a conflict that so much of the uh, army and, and other other facets in the army did uh, after World War One. Uh, there there was no real formal organization. Uh, within within the army, there were uh, there were some staff special staff sections that were devoted to it, and uh, there were a lot of uh, studies that were done that that sort of thing. But it was mostly uh, paper shuffling and not uh, any uh, build up of any formal 
infrastructure that you could put a label on and say that this is a psychological operations unit. Then when we got into uh, which which you know didn't leave us in very good shape as far as uh, the beginning of World War II. You know, Zoom World War II things really began really began to develop, and the uh, people began to use uh, psyops to a, a much much a greater degree. And I guess one of the one of the most uh, famous, uh, well known uh, psy operations was uh, the uh, the Ghost Division or the Ghost Army. And this is where they uh, they had built up a uh, a lot of mock. Uh, I was going to say, mock, mock units, and the units had uh, vehicles, and uh, if it was artillery unit, they, they had these uh, things built that looked like uh, cannons, uh, that looked like other pieces of equipment. As I say, look like it. this would have been, say, Germans or Italians flying over, uh, taking pictures of what was on the ground. And, and uh, they were hearing about this this unit. And I don't know what the designation was, but it was a formal designation. And uh, so it, they were uh, trying to get as much information about this unit as they possibly could, which caused them to divert a lot of resources to uh, this, this unit. And uh, they didn't know whether this unit was gonna come Roaring up through Italy, and and uh, they they had to uh, move units around to uh, block that possibility, and uh, it was it was quite a deception operation, one of the, one of the biggest ever, and one of the most uh, successful. And then the the uh, the British had one. I'm really going to run over time. <laughs> British had the one uh, fantastic operation where uh, they they wanted to uh, deceive the uh, Germans as to whether or not they were going to come straight up Italy or or into France or up up to uh, Italy through Sicily. They didn't know where the invasion was going to start, and so the uh, the uh, English wanted to make them think that it was going to come up, I think, up to Greece. And so uh, the, uh, the scheme was that they were going to have a, a body washed up on shore, and this body was going to be a, uh, a courier, and the courier was going to have these uh, top secret documents in his, in his satchel. Uh, which were going to lead the Germans to believe <laughs> that uh, they were going to come up, come up through Greece, and uh, in order to pull this thing off, uh, they went to the morgue, got a corpse, and uh, they they had to doctor up the corpse like it had been in the water for several days. There was a a, uh, several newscasts about this plane that had crashed just off, off offshore and uh, had sensitive material in it. So the stories were all built up like that. They went out in a small submarine and launched the, the body and uh, the Germans fell for it. They went out and they picked up the body, got the satchel, read the documents and thought that they were coming up to Greece and went over over there. So that was another successful uh, deception operation. But after World War II, uh, again, uh, the, the buildup of uh, PSYOPs that they had, and they had some units at that time that uh, were, uh, were being, being given flags 
being given certain designations. And it looked like the uh, organization and the, and the structure for it was coming coming together. But there still wasn't enough real real effort uh, or real real backing behind that. Uh, in Korea, uh, again, they, uh, they had some <laughs> they had some build up once once again. One of the one of the things that uh, came out of the Korean Korean conflict was uh, high high altitude leaflet dropping, and this this proved to be uh, a, a very successful ta tactic and gave us the capability of dropping leaflets uh, in such a such a manner where the uh, carrier, the aircraft, was was safe uh, in, in that it was a long distance away from the target. Like you could be 10, 15 miles out offshore, uh, have these leaflets dropped. And because of the uh, size of the leaflet and the weight of the paper and the altitude that you drop, and the winds aloft and how they were blowing on any particular day. It would take the leaflet cloud. And uh, if you did all of your homework right and got all of your math right, you'd hit, you'd hit a target maybe one or two miles inland. And that, that was one of the big contributions uh, that uh, the conflict in, in Korea made. Mm. But again, you know, we slipped back each time, but it was, you know, two up, one back. Sure. And, and uh, eventually so, we, we did have uh, some some units which made up uh, probably about what you might call the equivalent of a, of a, of a brigade. Mm. So just to sort of sum up, if I may, and, and tell me what, if I've missed anything or got anything wrong here, but it sounds like the objective of, of PSYOPs is to sort of, to kind of take the fight out of the enemy, right? As opposed to trying to defeat them in combat, you're trying to take the fight out of them. And you can do that through persuasion. Uh, you can do that through deception. Uh, but in any case, what you're trying to do is, uh, is weaken that force or weaken uh, the will to fight. Is that is that fair to say? Yes, it is. Uh, you, you got it. You're a good student. Well, thank you. So, uh, so you're now where we left off. You're you're now at Fort Benning, I believe. Uh, well, I just graduated and got orders to go to Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg. That's right. You did say Fort Bragg. And so. Uh, from Fort Bragg, how and when did you arrive in in uh, your first deployment in Southeast Asia, which I believe was in Laos? Right. Uh, well, I, at Fort Bragg, I had to do an awful lot of uh, study and, uh, and applying myself to get up on uh, what PSYOPs was all about. Hmm. At, at that point in time, I didn't, I didn't know, but I, I got I got lucky. There were a couple of captains that were doing a uh, review uh, and an update of the uh, PSYOP field manuals. They needed uh, some some help from somebody that could write reasonably, <laughs> and uh, so they uh, they grabbed me out of the uh, classroom where I was uh, trying to uh, qualify for my uh, MOS in PSYOPs and. Uh, sitting with them every, every single day uh, and they had been in in the business and even as civilians had been in the kind of the behavioral sciences business uh, they taught me a lot they taught, and I, I began to feel much more comfortable uh, when I was telling people what I was in and what I, what I was doing <laughs> so uh, the uh, And getting uh, lined up to go to uh, Southeast Asia, 
uh, the, sele the selection process uh, was uh, kind, of, kind of strange. We, there was a group that was told to go to a briefing room. We went to this briefing room and uh, there was uh, uh, two colonels in there that were conducting the briefing and they said that they were going to select a PSYOP team uh, and they wanted to uh, make it on an all volunteer basis. And so they said, we'll tell you bit by bit what's, what you're getting into. And uh, if, if at any time you wanna leave the room, you can. Uh, it's uh, you know, no, no bad intention fa <laughs> intentions following it. So that's what they did. They started out saying, hey, you're gonna go somewhere for six months. TDY and you'll be uh, pretty much uh, cut off from the world for that for that period of time. Highly classified uh, mission. And, and you were uh, you were already married at this point, right? All right. And uh, so uh, some people got up and they and they left and they kept willing it down. They, they said, "Okay, you'll be supporting special forces teams." And there'll be good guys and bad guys and, you know, that kind of situation. And so other people left and they started interviewing people. And uh, we got it down to about an even dozen. And uh, during the course of the interviews, uh, this, these two colonels uh, were trying to select people that uh, had certain skills, had certain MOSs, so that uh, there'd be a diversity on, on the team. And uh, one of the things that uh, there was a lot of emphasis on was uh, trying to pick up as much of the language as we could. And uh, the, other th the other thing was, when I got it down to that, that even dozen, uh, is they said, okay, we can tell you now, you're going to Laos. And when they said that, everybody started looking around at each other, and nobody out of that dozen had ever heard of the country of Laos. And uh, it, uh, it, 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 it was quite a re revelation. You know? And they said, okay, now does that change anybody's mind? And, you know, it didn't didn't matter. It could have been in Uzbekistan or wherever, because everybody that was still left had kind of bought into it. So then we started a six week training program, uh, which the, the language was was important. But we, uh, as sci operators, were interested in the country and the people and the. Uh, the, the, the diplomacy uh, information, uh, military that they had, and the economics, all those things, uh, uh, all those aspects of, of the country. And we put a man on each one of those to, to do the digging. And whenever uh, he felt like he had enough, to present, then uh, he was he would present that uh, information to the rest of the team, and so we got an area study that was put together, but it was extremely difficult because I mean we had, no one had ever heard of Laos, and there wasn't much much out there outside of encyclopedic information, which uh, wasn't exactly what we were looking for, but there it was. And so, yeah. what was the what was the what was the objective in Laos? This would have been what fifty nine, maybe six. This was sixty sixty one. Okay. And uh, the the main thing that they were trying to do was to prevent Laos from being uh, pulled in by the uh, by the uh, communist forces, which were predominant in North Vietnam. And things had gotten to the point where uh, a decision had to be made whether we were gonna send in ground troops to do that or special forces teams to train up the uh, Lao uh, army uh, to 
enable them to defend defend themselves against that threat. So it wasn't so much a concern that uh, the Laotians would would join up with the North Vietnamese. It was that they might be they might be in the path of the North Vietnamese. Well, uh, there there are a lot of different ways they could uh, provide assistance too. You know, mm -hmm. uh, food, clothing. Uh, give them, you know, as as they would move move through, if you're moving through a friendly environment, it's a heck of a lot easier than mm -hmm. uh, and, and people helping you all the way, and that's essentially what uh, they were, we were trying to uh, prevent from happening. But the uh, <laughs> it's funny the the Lao people were uh, kind of uh, what you call pacifists. No, they they weren't uh, you know uh, get up and go hell or high water types, uh, and and when when you found that uh, that type of individual, then you try to cultivate him into bringing others in. And what you what we normally found was that we would uh, have much much better results with people that came out of the. Uh, out of the mountains, the mountain tribes of uh, Laos. It was really odd. Down in the lowlands, people were cool. <laughs> Up in the highlands, uh, you know, don't uh, don't try to take my land away from me, or you're you're in for a fight. And that was one of the things that uh, got this got the tribal people on uh, on our side. We're on the side of the on the side of the government if they guaranteed that they were going to be able to keep their land. Mm. So you said this was 60 or 61, uh, yeah. and, and you arrive in Laos. This is your first time in Asia, uh, maybe your first time outside the United States. Um, what yes, it remember? was. Yes, it was. And uh, so what was that like for you? What do you remember most vividly about arriving in Southeast Asia? Well, <laughs> So it, it didn't matter to, it, where exactly uh, we we were we were arriving because uh, our concept of operations changed when we hit Bangkok. That was the biggest thing that 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 hit us. I mean, culturally, uh, it it was amazing. Uh, I couldn't believe uh, that you know people like this existed in, in the world. And, and the uh, this the statuary was magnificent. People living on the on the water, uh, the boat people that were uh, going up and down the river, and some people living living there just just could not believe it. And all of that was uh, you know was so strange and, and really awe inspiring. Uh, I, I even have. <laughs> A little, a little bit of that same same feeling when I drove across the United States one time. <laughs> Got out there in the Wyoming and uh, Colorado and those areas and went into to a barber shop and these guys are these ranchers are talking about their cattle and all this. And I thought that was really something. But that was nothing compared to the culture shock that I felt there in uh, in Bangkok. It was, it was just it was an it was an eye opener, it was really, really a big eye opener. And the other eye opener was uh, they changed their concept of operations, which you know this is another one of those uh, things I was talking about unusual circumstances that we didn't have any control over, and all of a sudden you had a completely different situation in front of you than the one you thought you were going to have, and. Uh, what they wanted uh, in in country was to put one of our one of our team members in each of the of the four military regions in the country, and the remainder was going to be in the capital of Vientiane. So, uh, in, in our uh, assessment of the situation back at Bragg, and then where there's only twelve of us for the whole country. So we better, you know, stay together, and, and we'll be able to uh, 
uh, provide the support in a much better fashion, much more coherent way uh, as, a, as a team than, you know, one individual here, one individual there, what, what, what could he do? But uh, of course they prevailed. The only thing that it showed was that there was not sufficient coordination between the two commands, the you know, losing and gaining commands there. Uh, and then that showed up and uh, we had uh, we had team meetings over that and we had to kind of do uh, what they do in the huddles at, uh, at the football games, you know. Okay, guys, we can't let this, you know, we can't let this uh, interfere in any way. We gotta, we're the first PSYOP team to, to be out here in a situation like this. And we gotta, we gotta bring, uh, we gotta bring the ball home. So uh, everybody left with, uh, you know, that, that kind of uh, mental attitude. And uh, when I was introduced into, uh, in, into the country, I was sent to Luang Prabang, which is the, referred to as the royal capital. So that's, that's where the palace of the king is. That's where the, the king lived. And uh, I was extremely fortunate to, uh, to get up there because all of the U.S. personnel were just really, really terrific professional people. They, uh, they almost, uh, well, all of the older, more senior people, the senior NCOs, and then uh, the, the one or two senior officers. Everybody was in civilian clothes, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and why was that? I mean, just so for listeners who don't. Why? Why was everybody in civilian clothes? The because uh, there was a, an interna international agreement that had been made. I guess in one of the Geneva agreements that uh, there would be no foreign countries intervening in in Laos when Laos was theoretically set up as a, an independent country. You weren't allowed to have any military in there, so we didn't have uniforms on. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were we? Well, I was I was bragging on <laughs> all these people in uh, in Luang Prabang. Uh, they had all uh, they had all been in. Uh, it seemed like every one of them had been in some uh, in some capacity in uh, one of the Asian countries be before. So they, uh, they, they were new, they knew what they were all about. And then the good thing was uh, they just accepted me in as a genuine full, uh, as a genuine member of, of the team and one that was ready to take on responsibility, although I wasn't. <laughs> as soon as they stepped off the plane, you know, they, they were ready. They drew me into the meetings right away and they started giving me uh, little things to think about and do. And uh, they, they were wondering about you know, what I had in, had in mind. I said, well, I want to look around a little bit before I start you know, spouting off at these uh, meetings that we were going to have. Colonel Nelson, he was, uh, he was the senior uh, military in, in the region, very reasonable guy. Uh, he, he told me I was going to be his information officer. Uh, I didn't argue with that. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I was going to do that. And, and he said, uh, he took me down as soon as he could to meet General Boon Luke, who was the uh, commanding general of the first military region. And he explained to the general that uh, I was going to be uh, a uh, advisory consultant on information matters. And uh, the general was real happy with it, We're very happy. And uh, I was just you know, sort of walking on eggshells there when I first got there, because I didn't, you know, 
everything was so strange. And, uh, you, you know, if we had moved into a, you know, another country that was say similar to France or Sweden or something like that, that would have been one thing. But then moving into this, this situation, totally Asian culture, uh, just so, so different that uh, it, it just really gave me pause until I got, until I got comfortable. And that was one of the other things that uh, I was thankful for. All these guys that, that were already there, they, were, they went out of their way to uh, do exactly that to make me uh, comfortable and, and, and confident in what, what I was doing there. The, the two people that I worked with most closely were a guy by the name of Frank Corrigan, who was the USIS representative there. And then the other guy was a uh, fellow by the name of Stu Methvin. He was the CIA case officer uh, assigned to Long Bar. And uh, they, they uh, took me by the hand and showed me around the first military region. And uh, I was real thankful for that. Anytime that they had a plane going anywhere, they, uh, they'd make that plane available to me. If I wanted to uh, uh, visit a particular area, they, they said, you, you, after this plane does this and that, then you can have it for the rest of the day. And uh, it'll be in the general area that, uh, you know, you got something going on, fine. So uh, that, that worked out great. Or they just make it available for uh, leaflet, leaflet drops. And uh, that, that worked out real, really well then. And... Uh, well, Ray, you've, uh, I mean, we, we're, we're, we've been talking for almost an hour and we're just still in your very first uh -huh. trip. It, it's okay. We're still on your very first, uh, tour, right. Which is the Laos tour in 1960. And we've still got three other tours that we got Cause you went four times to Southeast Asia. Right. So, uh, just in the interest of, uh, you know, keeping things moving, can you give me a sense of, um, you know, some of the tactics that you employed in Laos or, uh, uh or a specific memory of the operation in Laos, and then uh, how it wrapped up. Um, you know, you said that it was supposed to be six months. Was it six months? Um, did you leave it better than you found it? Um, just kind yeah. of sum up the Laos uh, tour for me. Well, uh, the, the two gentlemen I mentioned before, Stu and uh, Frank, these guys uh, put no limits on what, what could be done and you didn't have to worry about thinking outside the box because they were never in the box mm. and uh, they, a point uh, a point in fact there was a operation genie which uh, Frank uh, had, had come up with uh, they, usually uh, in, the, in the evenings we wound up in a hotel uh, lobby there in town and uh, planned out what was going to happen on the next day. And uh, Frank came up with this idea of uh, using bottles stuffed with leaflets and uh, dropped into those uh, in and around those hamlets that were uh, occupied or influenced by the Patet Lao, which was the communist group, the communist leaning uh, group, uh, fighting group in country. And uh, the way uh, he, he hoped it was going to work was uh, a lot of empty, usually empty wine bottles. We got about 40 or 50 of those together. We had uh, leaflets that uh, had been run off on the mimeograph machines and they were very rough and rough and rugged, uh, and some of them had no text whatsoever, but they had pictures on them, drawings, which uh, kind of told the story because uh, the uh, the reading level wasn't too good out there in those villages. So the idea was we were going to take off in a, take off in a small plane somewhere around dusk, come in real low, and uh, towards uh, a village that was a target and 
cut the cut the engine just before you came within hearing distance of, of the village and then glide over the village and as you're gliding over the village take these bottles that had the leaflets in them throw toss them out as the bottles were falling uh they would whistle through the air and it, it would it would make the sound of the pie the pie were uh spirits and these pie spirits inhabited everything the clouds and the, and the, and the fields and the wind and uh when the bottles hit the ground of course they they would break the the uh, leaflets would spread and uh, they'd be released just like the we would hope that the pie spirit would be released and free like the people should be released and free and that and they uh and not occupied by the uh Patet Lao or the or the North Vietnamese now this was uh and then on the other side on the other side of the village then you kick in the engine again and go on to the next next village and this is happening all around uh, at at dusk I wasn't on that I wasn't on that first flight and uh the uh but everything, everything came off just as perfect as it possibly could until they were coming back. And uh, when they were coming back and night had fallen and they didn't, we didn't have a, uh, lights uh, at Luang Prabang International Airport. So uh, we got flares and some trucks and jeeps and lined them up all the way down the, the runway and we, Got the uh, got the plane back safely. Mm. Operation Genie. But you mentioned some spirits. Pi. How how's that spelled? Oh, just P I. P I. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's in that book. Uh, Stu Metvin, the CIA uh, analyst, wrote a book called uh, "Laughter in the Shadows." And okay. a big portion of that book is the time that he spent in Laos. So you came back from Laos. Uh, how long were you there? We were there for the uh, full full six months. And one of the other things, uh, Frank, Frank and I, uh, that is USIS representative, Frank Oregon and I were planning a leaf, leaflet drop uh, campaign and uh, got up to early, early morning when we were about to kick this thing off. And we saw weather coming in and Frank said, uh, he'll, he'll take the plane and uh, he will uh, start the first round of the, the leaf of drop. He said, you can get a, I could get an air law flight after this storm blows through and uh, go down to a place called Cyborg, wait for him there. Anyway, uh, I I did that. Uh, got a uh, flight down to Sayaburi, and I was waiting down there for Frank. Then eventually got the word that uh, his plane had lost lost power, taking off, and had crashed into a mountainside, and uh, he uh, he died there. And uh, as a as a result, and there was another one of those things. As a result of that, the uh, USIS uh, chief and country asked me to run the office, the USIS office there in Luang Prabang, and uh, I told them I'd be more than happy to do that, uh, of course, until they found somebody to take Frank's place. And then two days uh, later, uh, Flora Corrigan uh, came up to Luang Prabang. Uh, that's Frank's, Frank's wife. She'd been evacuated to uh, Bangkok. She came back to uh, have uh, those honors that uh, people wanted to confer on Frank. Uh, she was representing him. And uh, so, and I was uh, more or less her escort for the time that she was there. And so we went from one function to another to another where all the uh, people, Frank was really loved, did a great job uh, for those people and the people loved him. And they wanted to show that to uh, his, his wife. And uh, the last, 
last confab was at the palace where the, uh, the king uh, gave her one of the highest uh, awards uh, of, uh, of their country. And while we're there at the palace, one of the king's aides slipped over to me and said, hey, the, uh, the radio station still gonna happen? And I said, yeah, yeah. Because Frank had uh, promised the king that he was going to build him a radio station. And this aide was asking if, if that was still going to happen. And, and I knew about the radio station and had been trying to track all the parts that were coming in for it. And uh, so that uh, wasn't, you know, wasn't a shock to me, but it, it, it was... <laughs> It was kind of uh, a little little kick in the pants. Hey, don't forget, don't forget the important things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't long after that that uh, we we got the last big thing built, which was the antenna field. And we already had the st station in pretty good shape. Okay. And I gotta, I gotta tell you this stuff. <laughs> What's that? Well, uh, the uh, the king of Laos, uh, who had been a, been the king for fifty years, had died in October of uh, fifty nine. They put his body in an urn and preserved it because they they had to postpone the the burial or the the actual. Uh, pyre burning of, of of the body because they couldn't get the red prince. The red prince was uh, the son of the king who had uh, aligned himself with the communists, and they couldn't get him to come into the funeral. They couldn't have the funeral without the whole family there, especially mm -hmm. uh, one of the sons. Mm -hmm. and, but they decided to do it in '61 while our while I was there. And uh, they uh, they knew that we had just finished off that radio station. They said, can you broadcast over that radio station? They said, yes, can you broadcast so everybody can hear it? I said, you mean the whole country? <laughs> they said, yeah, can you do that? I said, uh, we haven't, I hadn't tested it that far. I said, I think we can. So uh, we we set it up so that a uh, one of the Lao people that worked in the uh, USIS office put on a PRC-10 radio and he walked the funeral route when the funeral procession left the palace and it went down to the soccer field that was where the pyre was that they were going to uh, do the roasting on. And... Uh, the uh, the monks who had gone out into the forest to find the king's tree had successfully found his tree. They knew they knew it was. They brought the tree in, cut a big section out of it, hollowed it out, and put the put the body in there because that's that's the one that uh, was going to take him, take it to the uh, the uh, funeral site. And there were dignitaries from all the surrounding countries that, that came that day of the funeral. And uh, the guy in PRC-10 PRC was describing the uh, procession as it was going down down the street. And there was a, uh, we had a, an announcer at the, uh, at the soccer field who was in communication with him and he was, Hooked up to the uh, antenna field that we had that we had built that was being uh, so that his description was being uh, sent to Vientiane and Vientiane was then rebroadcasting it to the rest of the country. So we we pretty well got that done. Mm. And as soon as this as soon as this is over, I'll give you the. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the epilogue because it doesn't stop there. Mm.
Okay. So I, yeah, we finished up our uh, six, six months. Uh, the, uh, and then that, that was near the end of the, that six month period that they turned the, uh, uh, the Lao group, the Lao US personnel into a MAG, uh, full MAG mission. MAG? Yeah, military assistance group. Hmm. And uh, so that then they were okay with the uh, international agreements that had been made, I guess, or they had changed them to where you know that could be done. But and then they they brought in a shipment of uniforms, and because everybody was going into uniform except me, as Colonel Nelson said, you stay like you are because they think you're USIS anyway. And uh, he said it might disrupt how they how they think of you if you all of a sudden pop up in a in a uniform. So uh, we did that. Said our uh, our farewells and uh, got back to Bragg. And I thought, well, this would be a good time to kick back, take it easy, maybe do a little fish, play a little golf. Not so, because. Uh, JFK was coming down to Fort Bragg and uh, the uh, Style Battalion Commander one uh, appointed me as the project officer for the PSYOP portion of the uh, briefings and the exhibits and everything else. So that, that took four months. To prepare? Yeah. To get ready for JFK to come down because he was coming. He was coming down to make it a that Green Beret official. See, they wasn't they weren't the Green Berets yet mm. until JFK came down there that day, and uh, he uh, almost jokingly said, uh, "Hey, where are those uh, Green Berets I've heard so much about?" And he gave him. Uh, that was when he gave him the blessing, and. Uh, that's they've even got statues there for brag about that happening. General Yarborough was the commander then, and of course uh, JFK. Uh, I think he's passing him uh, one of the one of the berets, one of the statue to another. Mm. So at this point, you hadn't seen your wife in quite some time. Um, no, not true. Not true. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you didn't see her for the six months you were in Laos, right? Right. Well, I was thinking of I was thinking of another uh, another another trip I made to uh, Vietnam when uh, I was able to get to Hawaii. That was mm. it was just just going through my mind now. But that's a that's a great story too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, you should you really ought to consider putting all this into a book at some point. My wife has been after me for the past two years to to do something about it. Yeah, yeah, it it definitely uh, has got that that to it, and who knows, Hollywood might be interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, you know, and you don't have to write it either. You know, if you want to get it done quickly, uh, you could just find a, a ghostwriter, and you can just get together with that person periodically and tell stories and that person will put it all into a book for you, which you can then edit and, you know, shape the way you want it to be. Well, we might, might want to get serious about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, you can, you can really uh, accelerate the process that way. Of course, you know, then you have to pay the ghostwriter so that, you know, that becomes uh, you know, a financial consideration, but it certainly would make it make the process. Hey, I'll tell you, Mike, there, there, there are so many different little little things that happen uh people would think it's bullshit yeah yeah you know, that's because, that's why it's important to get it recorded i think because the the stories they, really really are unbelievable yeah uh, because i was i was just <laughs> i was just thinking about the next the next episode and uh I would have been in 64. Uh, uh, after uh, when, when things uh, settled there at, uh, at, at Bragg, I was going on to my next assignment. My next assignment was in Okinawa. 
which was with the United States Broadcasting and Visual Activities Pacific Command. This was a unit that provided uh, psychological operations support to the entire Pacific theater. And uh, I ended up uh, in the uh, mobile radio company. And uh, the mobile, <laughs> I have to tell you these things. The mobile radio company, uh, of course, was ready to deploy anywhere at the drop of a hat, wherever they might be needed, and uh, establish a radio station. So the theory was, you know, insurrection going on in a country, coup d'etat uh, against the government that uh, we support. And of course, in the uh, coup d'etat manual, chapter one, first thing you do is take over the radio station, right? So mm -hmm. that would be taken over and then our station would, would maybe they would fly it in or float it in and uh, turn that over to the government that we were supporting. Mm. And uh, one of the first things that you had to do was to put up an antenna. And they, we had a temporary antenna, which was just a, a long straight wire, maybe about 15 feet long. And you hook this up to the bottom of a dirigible dirigible was about a, about a 15 footer and gas it up up it goes so when when I get uh, when I get there as the XO of the radio company I said we got to get out in the field and try all this stuff because they hadn't nobody there had done anything uh, as far as uh, training up to be able to do what we were, what our mission was <laughs> so they they uh, got everything out there into the training area and got the dirigible up, gassed it up, hooked it up to the wire. And then the, the uh, guy lines that were tethering the uh, dirigible slipped out of the hands of the guys that were supposed to be controlling it. And off went the dirigible. Off and away. How long do you think it took before a jet fighter intercepted it? Because it was an unidentified flying object over Okinawa. I'm guessing not long. How long do you think it took before somebody was chomping my ass? <laughs> Probably not, not too long after that. Exactly. Yeah. So how long was it? <laughs> It was a lot, but we we had to put in a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of new procedures uh, whenever we were going out to the field. Uh, but uh, it it was a pretty quick response, you know. And it gave everybody some something to talk about and something to reflect on and uh, something to put into our lessons learned folders. You know, so it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't all. It wasn't all bad. Mm. It didn't do any good for my uh, efficiency report, as I recall. Though. Your what report? Efficiency report. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So after Okinawa, did you come back stateside, or did you go straight to your next assignment from there? Well, after uh, during Okinawa, we had another team set up and introduced into uh, Vietnam. And uh, that's when we had our uh, radio station uh, established with uh, the, uh, what eventually became the Studies and Observations Group, uh, SOG. I don't know if you've heard of SOG before. I'm not. Uh, the most uh, most decorated unit in uh, in Vietnam, and uh, our uh, our objective was to establish a radio station which was broadcast to North Vietnam, and it was a joint joint venture between the U.S. and uh, South Vietnamese, and this was a white radio station. You're familiar with the white gray. Oh. What can I do with you, Mike? Sorry. <laughs> you gotta you gotta learn something about science. 
We got uh, white, gray, and black, which essentially uh, tells you who initiated the particular action or event. If it's if, if it was a white event, just like Voice of America, that's all white radio because you know who it is. Okay, putting it out and gray. Is that in between area? You don't really know. There's no attribution. Like a, a leaflet comes down and it doesn't say this was printed by the U.S. or whatever. And then black, you say, "Hey, I'm this." When you're not, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, you got, and and all those shades work in. Oh, there she is. Tell her we're going to be a little while longer. <laughs> so, uh, what it said on the screen? Oh, I don't know. We, we don't worry about that, I guess. I don't see anything on my end. No, I've I've got this thing that says meeting is being recorded. Yeah, that's all. You can just ignore that. Yeah. No. So the. Uh, it took uh, several several weeks after we got there uh, to get the, the station up and running, and we had all kinds of little little problems. And we were in a the station location was in a villa, uh, about a six bedroom villa just outside of town, and there was an eight foot wall all the way around the villa, so it was it was perfect for us because of security reasons, and there was a there was enough room in there for us to bring in our uh, uh, all of our machinery, the, the station itself. And we established a transmitter up near the demarcation line between North and South Vietnam. And, and uh, we flew up the uh, taped newscasts every day. We would, have, uh, we would have a newscast or a special feature, depending upon what it was. To, and then those were most of, the, most of the things we did. And of course, there was always music filling, uh, filling the gaps. But uh, the, uh, the main thrust was uh, in, the, in the newscast, which had to be the absolute truth of what was going on because uh, the, our, our credibility uh, as a new radio station there was just hanging by a hair all the time and it wasn't going to take much to uh, uh, discredit us as far as the North, uh, which was our target audience, believing what they heard over uh, our station, which was called the Voice of Freedom. Mm. And uh, every everything was uh, tested pretty pretty well, and a good thing it was to, was one uh, one night in I forget what night it was, but uh, there was a destroyer out in the Gulf of Tonkin, which uh, some uh, North Vietnamese uh, PT boats took. Uh, Took an unliking too, and they they launched a couple of a uh, couple of torpedoes and that's ran an assault against the uh, I think it was USS Maddox, and uh, then the I don't know if it was the following day or night or shortly after that, the Maddox had been reinforced with the Turner Joy and an aircraft carrier, and the next next time was which was just within a couple of days, uh, the next time some uh, boats came in to uh, rough up the uh, US naval vessels, they didn't do too well. And so uh, there were some burning candles out in the Gulf of Tonkin and then uh, some jets from the uh, aircraft carrier hit uh, fuel dumps on the uh, uh, on the uh, coastal area of uh, North Vietnam, and uh, as a result of all of all of that, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution came into being. 
which gave uh, LBJ uh, just about uh, war, uh, wartime power. Mm. So uh, we were in the position of uh, having to come up with uh, the news and, and news and views of all of that and, and explaining to the North Vietnamese why uh, the uh, oil oil dumps and gas dumps on the on the mainland had been had been hit, and so uh, at at best uh, the, uh, the 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 policies that we dealt dealt with were very sensitive when nothing was happening as far as North Vietnam is concerned. Uh, there hadn't been anything going on in North Vietnam except for some uh, what are what were SOG activities. And some bridges were blown up and a few things like a few things like that because they had some deception operations going on in there. In order to give the deception operation some credibility, they they had to pull off some stunts like that. But uh, so uh, we were very, very careful about, about what we were saying, but uh, the State Department was very, very slow in coming up with the guidance that, that we expected to have almost immediately. And uh, so <laughs> we, uh, we tried to lighten it up as much as we possibly could, you know, saying, no, oh, the response was just uh, what, what it should have been. It wasn't too much, it wasn't, uh, we, we uh, were the, uh, we were the recipients of an unprovoked attack by these, by these vessels. And uh, we didn't think it, it was, you know, too much of a response, but still, they, they didn't know whether or not, uh, since bombs had actually been dropped on North Vietnam for uh, just about, well, that was probably the first time it had been done so overtly. Uh, they thought that perhaps the U.S. was going to come in there with uh, large military units and maybe even cross the line and come up there to uh, move things around in North Vietnam. Hmm. And uh, LBJ was not averse to having that as uh, as the party line. And that's pretty much what it, what it came to be after that. After uh, Kennedy was assassinated, LBJ wanted to uh, come up with some strong, strong moves. And keep the uh, North North Vietnamese uh, on edge as far as what our intentions were going to be. What was your next question? Uh, well, I just I wanted to get to uh, you know there there's still what another another tour or two um, that we haven't talked about. So um, you know, do you want to do you want to pick a, a story or an operation? Uh, well, the, what, what, the next, when they, when the next the, time, the next, okay, I'll interrupt. <laughs> the next time uh, I uh, came up on orders to go uh, to Vietnam, I was uh, I was uh, again back at back at Bragg uh, as uh, as an instructor, and. Uh, much of the instruction was uh, about what was going on in Vietnam, of course. Sure. And, now, Ray, sorry, Ray. Let me now, let me interrupt. So, it's, what what rank are you at this point, Captain? So, you at some point you you and did I, com you you completed OCS. Did you also complete your college degree? Because I understand, um, from my understanding, that's a requirement, right? So, did you finish? Much. Yeah. So, how did that yeah, work? I, uh, what I, what I did was uh, they had an external degree program at New York State University. 
And I got into that. I just sh shoveled all my credits to them. Uh, and uh, whenever I could, I was taking night school courses. Uh, and uh, so I, with the night school courses and what I'd done up to that point, and they gave me some credit for some of the uh, positions I'd held in, in, in the army. And so I said, okay, we'll give you, we'll give you a, a piece of paper here. Okay. Okay. That's how that, that Got it. Got it. And did you have to, did you have to complete that before you could be commissioned or, or was it in parallel? How did that work? No, that, that uh, it was one of the things that they evaluated, of course, when uh, they were going to give you promotions. But I, I you know, I, I was I was a commissioned officer. So, OK. Uh, the, that only figured into whether or not I was going to get my next rank in a sub lieutenant first captain major. And, and I got. Uh, I guess it, I, I guess it was on my next my next Vietnam thing, next Vietnam tour that uh, I, I got uh, my promotion to major. Okay, so I'm sorry I interrupted. You were uh, you were at Fort Bragg as a captain, as an instructor, and you were instructing people about uh, psyops in Vietnam. That was uh, that was a big chunk of it, and uh, then. Oh. So what year? What year is this now, Ray? Um, six, sixty-six, sixty-six, sixty-seven. Okay. And uh, when uh, this this trip, when I got got to Vietnam, I was uh, assigned to the uh, six. Six I up battalion as the S three, and uh, when I got there, the S three and the XO uh, uh, both had come up on uh, orders at, at the same time, and uh, so they were they were short timers, and the uh, the battalion commander of Colonel Malice was uh, on the. Uh, on the road back to the States to do some briefings about uh, the expansion of the 6th IOP battalion into what became the 4th PSYOP group. Because was, people began recognizing uh, the effect that uh, psychological operations was ha having. And uh, that was pretty much across the board, up and down the country, that people were asking for additional support loudspeaker teams, leaflets to be dropped in their areas, uh, agitprop teams to, to come in and work in the villages. And they were asking for all these things, which pretty far exceeded the capability of the battalion. They just didn't have the assets to uh, answer the call. So uh, the uh, XO and the S3 had come up with a uh, a plan on how to expand the battalion into a group, which essentially made uh, the companies in each one of the military regions into a battalion. And when I got there, uh, all of the work had been done, thank God. Mm -hmm. Because this was all force development work. I didn't know anything about force development. And uh, the third day that uh, I was in, in country, uh, there was a phone call from USRV headquarters saying that there was an important meeting going on. Uh, someone from the someone from the operations officer office of the battalion is should be up here attending this meeting. So the SO and the X three they're they're out there. Uh, Getting getting ready to leave, doing all the paperwork necessary to get a, get out of country, and Colonel Melise is uh, back in uh, Hawaii on his way to Washington to brief uh, everyone that uh, will listen to him uh, on the expansion of the sixth battalion to the fourth group. 
So uh, I was kind of the, the uh, de, de facto uh, monkey monk in charge. Hmm. So I, yeah. I got the jeep, go up to the, the headquarters, go, went down to the briefing room. I got there a little late. The briefing was already underway. There was a colonel up at the uh, front of the room. It's a big, big room held about, uh, there were about 50 people in there. They all had ADP printouts sitting on the uh, desk in front of them. And they're going, going down these long lists that were in this uh, ADP. And uh, the colonel up at the, up at the uh, front of the room was shouting out uh, his uh, desi unit designations. And uh, he was throwing in some language that I didn't even, didn't even begin to understand because they're all acronyms I was not familiar with. It all had to do with uh, force structure. And uh, I sidled in alongside a, of a, someone that had been there. And I said, what's going on? And he whispered in my ear, he said, back channel, sec def, new ceiling. Sec def what? <laughs> he said, back channel, sec def, new ceiling. New ceiling. And I, I nodded my head like I knew what the hell he was talking about. I said, oh, yeah, OK. And then I looked down at the ADP printout in front of him, and that he'd been scratching on it. And I saw listed there uh, on the page that he had open uh, a couple of uh, PSYOP units. And uh, then when he flipped the page again, and the colonel up at the front of the room was, is barking out these uh, other other unit designations. I uh, saw a few more, so I just got out my pen and pen and paper and started writing all these all these things down. And what that colonel was doing, and what this was all about, I found out later, uh, was that uh, there was a message coming out in the very near future. And of course, what we were looking at was the back channel, that is the presage, presager of the uh, message that was about to come out. Mm -hmm. and, that, and now I knew what a back channel was. <laughs> and uh, what the ADP printout was, was the entire force structure for Vietnam. And the colonel up there was uh, saying, these, these are the units that are going to be cut from the force structure for the next period. I don't know if it was uh, the one starting at the end of the year or the one starting in October, but uh, whatever, whatever that was, it, these were all cuts that were going to happen. And there were uh, a considerable number of uh, you know, PSYOP uh, detachments or teams, uh, and in some cases, uh, whole, whole units, of course, I assumed that what I was seeing in there was the fourth group that uh, the XO and the S3 had worked on. And now it was being uh, cut asunder. Hmm. And then the Colonel, when he uh, completed the briefing up there, uh, he says uh, he wants an impact statement in to uh, user headquarters, his headquarters, there uh, no later than tomorrow noon. And uh, we were, everyone was supposed to, you know, shed the, shed their tears and <laughs> write up how difficult it was going to be to do their job or what the uh, uh, what the impact is going to be as far as uh, mission accomplishment and all that is concerned and, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, when i left the uh, when i left the headquarters i made sure i had all the information i could get my hands on as far as the cuts were concerned and uh, i got i got that got back 
got back to the uh, battalion and could not find the S3 or the XO. And I had people out trying to trying to dig them up because those those two guys were the only ones that knew, uh, as far as I knew, the only two that knew anything at all about what the fourth group was uh, going to be all about, if it was even going to be. And uh, couldn't couldn't find it, couldn't find them. So I got got an admin NCO and uh, one other uh, S three NCO who had worked with the uh, major in the S three, uh, and started pulling all the files that had anything and everything to do with uh, the work that they had done in the previous, uh, I guess about six months that they've been working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to educate myself on that. And so that that was an all nighter, took all night to get that done and to get a, uh, a an impact statement put together. And I had a courier uh, take that up to user V headquarters. And about that time, here comes the uh, XO, uh, Walsh again, and I told him everything that had happened. And he said, uh, did you send an impact statement up? And I said, yeah, here's a copy of it. He looked at it and shook, <laughs> shook his head. And he said, uh, give me a paper and some pencil, <laughs> a pencil. And he sat down and he wrote a magnificent impact statement, really beautiful. This guy could. This guy could write, and he, he was uh, he uh, he was good. He knew, he, and he knew the psyop business really well too. Mm. And of course, he'd worked on that project for for six months. So, uh, and when he finished, I took that one up myself to uh, to the headquarters, and uh, that 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 began a long string of uh, meetings and. Uh, bartering, you know, it was uh, it was a real education to uh, see how uh, these things were put together. And what uh, uh, what what were some of the highlights of that impact statement that he wrote? Well, uh, when when you write about uh, the well the, the capacity that we had on the island or on the, on the uh, just within the battalion to turn out uh, our uh, leaf, leaflet work. We we're talking about doing something many times on the order of uh, uh, 150 million leaflets in a month. And sometimes more than that. And at the same time, we're supposed to be able to respond to quick reaction uh, situations that occur. So you, you begin to pile all that up, and then pretty soon you can't do it. Can't do it in the, in the time that that's required. And and those things, uh, the, those times and days and amounts, uh, are not things that are just you know thrown out there and and, and made up. They're, you know, real, real numbers. And uh, so when we're talking about printing capability, just the printing capability, uh, it, it just didn't, didn't make any sense unless we were, unless we were beefed up. Mm. And we found this, the same thing uh, in say the number of loudspeaker teams that we would be able to put into the field. You know, we, the number of requests that we would get for the uh, loudspeaker teams versus what we were able to send. Uh, and in every single case, uh, and we had, fortunately, we had the uh, paperwork to back it up, all these requests, you know, messages, emergencies, that, emergency messages that would come in asking for support. And uh, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to be there if all these cuts were going to be made. We weren't making it now. You know, things were, and that's why we had gone to 
the, the trouble of putting the fourth group on on paper and uh so uh that's that's the kind of thing that went into uh, the impact statement mm. um, so you said that impact statement sparked uh, a series of me meetings and discussions right and and uh there were two two action officers and i got to know them pretty well because uh after uh every just about every single day after the normal workloads were taken care of, I'd go up to UCB headquarters where these there were two majors that were going over all of these impact statements and uh, doing the pluses and the minuses. And, you know, it was always the, the general officers that were, that were doing the, the briefings and, and whatnot at, at the higher headquarters uh, or, <laughs> But it was these two majors who, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, night after night after night, uh, that were making it really happen, and uh, giving those people the, the the briefers the the kinds of information that they needed to have. But uh, it was very relaxed in the evening there. You know, you're up, you're up there at eight nine o'clock at night banging out paper, paperwork and and then some, some somebody from a unit comes in to argue with you and and uh, so these guys kept a cooler there and every once in a while you know they, they'd uh, take a little break reach into the cooler and uh, have a uh, have a beer unfortunately that beer was either like when they have valentine and uh, I think it was Valentine, and then of course the local beer thirty three, which was terrible. And uh, I had <clears throat> from my previous uh, previous assignment, I I had uh, some friends in in special forces, and special forces would run a uh, C one thirty every once in a while to the Philippines, and come back with it. And, loaded with San Miguel, San Miguel beer, just as much as the plane could carry. And then they passed that out to the uh, Special Forces uh, headquarters and teams in the country. And I had a couple of those. So when I when I brought the San Miguel in and put it in their cooler, it kind of raised my esteem, I think, and may have helped establish the fourth SIOP group in it did now. Yeah. All that debating, what it really came down to was uh can you put some beer in my cooler? San Miguel. San Miguel, specifically. Yeah. That was <laughs> that was the brewery that MacArthur got st started. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And uh he may have had a little percentage of it, who knows? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, then, so then, oh, go ahead. <laughs> we we had a uh, we had uh, captured a VC colonel, and the colonel was amenable to writing a letter back to uh, the VC units that uh, knew him and uh, he had been in control of, and he was going to uh, tell them, you know, the the. Uh, the kind of reception that he received, the good, uh, you know, the good things that he was able to enjoy now, and he was uh, appealing to them to lay down their weapons and and come in, just bring in. If you have a safe conduct pass, all the better, you know. They gave him instructions on how how to use that. Anyway, we had these leaflets made up with this VC colonel, and it was in the. Uh, 6th Battalion Headquarters, and the headquarters was in a theater uh, in, in the middle of the town. It was, uh, it was the biggest theater, I guess, in the country, the Kindo, where they took, and we took out all the seats to make room for uh, paper storage and also uh, the offices, you know, the S1, the S2, and, and all that. And 
one of the things, uh, the, the other part of the story, when you first arrived there in uh, in Saigon, things were uh, things were a little tight. And there weren't that many uh, facilities available, so uh, you stayed in a temporary BOQ. And the temporary BOQ was, you know, an old hotel. And each of the rooms had uh, four, four or six double bunks, in in them, and. Uh, on, on one of the walls was in, in the instructions for you to follow in the event of a, uh, a bomb and in the event of an explosion. And it said, roll out of your bed. And uh, once you hit the floor, roll under the bunk and stay there for at least five minutes because that, that was their uh, modus operandi. They, they'd have a bomb go off wait for a crowd to gather and then set off on a second bomb within five or 10 minutes of the first one. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm on, I'm on the upper bunk. Those are tile floors. I am not rolling out of that, <laughs> the top bunk onto that floor. I may ease my way out, you know. It was December the 4th. When the bomb went off and they blew our headquarters to smithereens, it was only a couple of blocks away from where the temporary BOQ was. And that explosion woke me up. I was on the floor before the guy on the first lower bunk <laughs> even thought about getting out of there. You beat him to the floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, easy. And, uh, so the uh, the explosion had completely blown off the the, the roof of the building. Um, this was called. This is we're talking about what was later called the Christmas bombing, or was this a different bombing? This it happened on four December. I don't know if I, yeah. I don't even know about the Christmas bombing. Yeah, I think we're talking about the same the same bombing. I don't know why they call it the Christmas bombing, but I've had uh, it's come up before. Uh, uh -huh. Let me just do a little search here, make sure we're talking about the same one. Uh, no, we're talking about, I'm talking about, yeah, sorry, I'm getting my bombings mixed up. Christmas bombing refers to our bombing of Hanoi. Uh -huh. But I have heard this story before about the December bombing of, uh, yeah, so we headquarters had, where a lot of all of our all of our uh uh you know top brass were and no we didn't have top brass in there it was mostly uh enlisted personnel hmm. and uh we you know i told you about the uh vc colonel they were you know, we pegged that as the reason that they uh, they blew the headquarters up because they didn't want that leaflet going out. Uh, but they they probably had uh, that theater under observation. They could they probably were ready to blow that any time they wanted to, because right next to it there was a there was some construction going on, and that's how they uh, probably got something like uh, thirty to forty pounds. Of plastic explosive in there, and that, and that uh, there was a there was a section of the floor or ceiling, I guess for me it was the ceiling that was blown out of the there, and it was they blown down onto my desk, and it was about three or four feet in diameter, and maybe about six six inches thick. There was re reinforced concrete, that and that blast actually moved uh, some people that were up on the balcony area over the balcony onto the onto the floor below and uh, there were I think there were 11 purple hearts uh, that came out of that hmm. yeah so in addition to trying to keep uh, daily things going on, 
uh, we were we were in the throes of trying to move move the headquarters somewhere. Had to find a place to begin with, and uh, the uh, immediate aftermath was uh, engineers came down, took a look at the building, said this is unsafe. You can't go in the building. So so we ended up on the street. We built a. So some uh, 55 gallon drums up, some little barbed wire, and uh, created an, an area around the telephone lines. So we're literally, literally sitting out on the street, uh, conducting uh, a normal business. The the uh, center of psyops in in Vietnam, <laughs> and all these qu quizzical eyes are. Uh, circling around the uh, barricades that, that we had put up and people are answering the phone. They're saying, uh, six high up a time, wine is not secure, <laughs> which is what you had to say every time you answered the phone, you had to say, wine is not secure. And here are all these, these Vietnamese are circling around there about 10 deep. Uh, and uh, I'm saying, yeah, that's secure, right? You get it. Mm. Well, um, do you have time for one more question? Do I have time? Yeah. I'll keep you here all night. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess my... I mean, well, how about two more questions? Let's let's. Um, I mean, you came back from from Vietnam, and you you continued your career in the army. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And uh, how long did you serve overall? Twenty. Twenty years. Yeah. And all of that time in psyops. No, it was eleven years in psyops. Mm. And. Uh, the rest, uh, I had uh, pushed troops in basic basic training there at uh, Fort Fort Benning for a year, and uh, ended up uh, in my final uh, final couple of years as a uh, logistician in a support command in Germany. Uh, Needless to say, they were not as uh, exciting or as memorable assignments as as the ones in Vietnam. Well, let me uh, let me cover the cover one more for you, Mike. Okay. One of the uh, one of the projects I had there at Bragg as a, as an instructor was to come up with. Uh, some new courses for the unit officer and uh, staff officer for people that wanted to get into the PSYOP, PSYOP business and earn uh, the MOS for a PSYOP officer. And those, uh, those two courses uh, were completed on paper uh, just before I came up on orders to uh, to go to Vietnam. And uh, the orders that I had to go to Vietnam were uh, by way of the uh, International Police, not the International Police Academy, the uh, what am I trying to think of? And I'll be right with you. Okay. I just I drew a blank on the uh, that's not the International Police Academy. What was it? The Foreign mm -hmm. Services Institute. Yeah, the foreign. That's it. Foreign Services Institute. Institute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I was supposed to go to Vietnam by way of the Foreign Service Institute. The Foreign Service Institute was uh, 
had developed a uh, program for district senior advisors. These, these were the uh, people that were going to go in as uh, advisors in the, in the district in the districts and it was a district level program which uh, had proven to be very successful and uh, one of the things that uh, they did in the, in this program uh, which ran about rough, roughly five to five to six months somewhere in, uh, in, in that time uh, one of the things that they, they did was to provide you with the uh, district that you were going to be assigned to. You knew you know, in advance exactly where you were going. And while you were there in Washington going to school, uh, they sent from Vietnam the uh, situation reports from that district, uh, uh, bios of uh, the uh, the people that were uh, of any importance in the uh, government structure in that province and in that uh, in that district, so you had a really good feel for exactly what you were uh, going to get into. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could hit the, so you could hit the ground running when you got there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, that—that's my note on it. Hit the ground running, because you know, so so often, and it was uh, one of the hits against uh, the uh, time that people spent in, in Viet Vietnam was you know it took you thirty days, sixty days to get you know to get grounded and, and to become semi-effective in your job, and uh, then on the tail end you took took you 30 days to get out of there so you know that that really wasn't uh, a full what you call a full 12 month tour mm -hmm. and in uh and in this case uh they had uh, to some degree uh solved that problem so uh, when uh when the uh course was course was completed I was uh, it was uh, in between Christmas and New Year's I, I left left for Vietnam I think it was three days three days after Christmas and uh, when I when I got to uh, Thompson Thompson a couple of days later, I was uh, in in processing, and they were taking. They took my orders and, and uh, put them in a uh, in a box that had uh, the name "Play Coup" on the box. And uh, I said, "No, no, no, no!" I said, "I'm not going to play coup. I'm going to this district in in the Delta. It was a beautiful little district. I had pacification written all over it was it sounds it sounded good it wasn't and you and you in addition to sounding good you had prepared for that yes exactly right mm -hmm. and uh i said no you you're going to uh you're going to go to play cool i said no no, no there's some mistake here <laughs> i said i can't be going to play cool i said i, I, I essentially wasted these last six months. They said, well, here's the message. You know, they had a message down there and it had stamps on it, emergency, important and all that. And, and uh, what the message said was they will, the uh, province ad advisor wanted the next school trained this district senior advisor that steps off the plane assigned to play curve. And three days later, there I was, and the, having dinner in the play crew mess hall, in in play crew, and they uh, 
deputy dis deputy province chief who is, who is a colonel Bachinsky came by and he said i want you to come over to the boq when you finish eating so uh i was anxious to, to see what that was all about of course and so i uh I gulped down the last bean, and then I came over to his his room at the BOQ, and he's sitting there with a, a uh, his buddy Johnny Walker, and uh, for uh, all, what must have been at least one solid hour, he talked about what was wrong in the district that I was going to. There's a district called Funya. Now to give you an idea or a feel for it, there, uh, the uh, provinces and districts in Vietnam were rated. There was a system of, of rating them as far as pacification and uh, other projects are concerned. And Pleiku province was the worst province in the country. And of the three districts in Pleiku, Funya was the worst district. And uh, so that made Funya the worst district in the entire country of Vietnam. And uh, I, when he started ticking off everything <clears throat> that was wrong in the district, uh, you know, I, I could only say one thing when he was finished. I said, Colonel, I said, you got to be shitting me. He said, no. He says, that's the way it is. And he said, it may it may be worse, he said, because I don't think I know everything. Well, he was talking yeah. about big drug problems uh, that were there, not necessarily with the, the U.S. people, uh, but the, the district chief himself was very, you know, very corrupt individual. He, he had all kinds of shenanigans going on that were making him money. He had uh, a tax that he was levying on uh, the uh, merchants going up up and down the road, you know, to pass through his district. It cost you so much. And, and these uh, were all, you know, this was going to be all these little hurdles that you're going to have to jump over. So, uh, I, I asked naively, I said, uh, well, how much overlap will I have with the district senior advisor that's down there now? And he says, none. He can't help you. I said, okay. And so the next day, I'm on the helicopter going down to Fuyang. Yeah, was, sorry, can I can I interrupt there for one second? What, what did he mean by that? He can't help you. Well, normally you would expect that the guy that's been there for, I don't know how long he'd been there. I think he'd been there for about eight months or something like that. Yeah, that he'd have some perspective to share or some some process or contacts or something of value for you. Yeah, that's exactly what you <laughs> would expect. And so why didn't, why couldn't he help you? In the judgment of Colonel Baczynski, who I... Uh, subsequently learned to uh, trust his judgment. He couldn't, he couldn't. Okay. Okay. It was that bad. And uh, it was it was strange when I got down there, the, the, uh, the <clears throat> chopper landing was just, part of the compound was just outside of the compound. And I, Got off, threw my duff bag out, and got off the chopper. And this major was uh, standing there. He threw his duff bag on, didn't shake hands, nothing. Didn't, didn't look at me. He just got on the, the chopper, never shut down. He got on, I, I got off. And, uh, that was the last the last time I saw him. The first and only and last time I saw him. And guess what his last name was? What? Major. 
His, his name was Major Major. That is amazing. I feel like that's <laughs> a I feel like that's a joke, right? That's I've I've heard that before. Yeah, it was uh, it was a fan, it was a book. Was it um, uh, Catch Twenty Two? Catch Twenty Two, yeah. Yeah. There was a major major in there. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And uh, so that was my introduction to the uh, to the district. And Pachinski said I could uh, I could uh, have anybody I wanted there. And I said, well, I don't know anybody here, so I don't know you know who would want to have you know out of the people that were in Pleiku City, if if there was anybody. And I, and uh, he said, anybody you want to get rid of after you've been there for a while, you want to move out? Uh, he said, uh, I'll give you carte blanche on that. So he was going to, you know, back me all the way, but uh, I didn't have didn't have too good of a feeling about old, <laughs> old Foon John. And uh, a couple of days later, uh, the district chief was throwing a, a big shindig uh, for lunch in my honor, and he had the uh, the village as many as of the village chiefs that he could get to to come in. And uh, before uh, we had the first first bite, the, the chief got up and started making a, uh, a a speech and he was he was about three quarters schnockered and uh, he was he was talking about how the uh, US was after him and he said that I I was uh, a member of the CIA I wasn't a major in the army I was CIA and they were after him because of all these made up charges that they had against, against him. And he was going on and on and on. And uh, I really felt sorry for my interpreter. <laughs> and, you know, he was, he was sweating bullets because he had to, you know, he had to tell me, mm -hmm. tell me all this stuff. And I kept encouraging. I said, you know, I said, give me every word. I said, don't, don't let, uh, don't let this bother you. I said, it's not, it's okay. <laughs> but I had to, I had to get him calmed down to make sure I was getting a good translation. But I knew pretty much what, uh, what the chief was saying. And that, and that was, you know, that's just the way that it was uh, for pretty much the whole time I was there. He had a lot of uh, family connections uh, that, that kept him in that job. And he didn't, you know, he had no love whatsoever for the mountain yards. Uh, he was Vietnamese, of course, and uh, that made that made uh, the the problem that much that much worse because uh, he was uh, you know every once every once in a while he, he would uh, come up with uh, a, a remark and be overheard by the mountain yards and you know that just it just made it that much more terrible. But, and I had a pretty good rapport with him. One of the one of the things that helped was uh, one of one of my interpreters was a uh, son of the the uh, the biggest village in in the in the province, and so uh, that guy carried a lot of weight, and he loved his loved his son, and his son and I got along got along really well. And uh, that that paid some major dividends because I was able to get around the 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 chief, the district chief, whenever I wanted to get something done. And if I, if it had to be uh, something done out in in the villages in the district, uh, I always leaned on that one chief, and and he and, and he would help. One time uh, we were making some. Big moves, and uh, and the uh, Pleiku City was going to be asked to send a couple of uh, trucks down to help us out with that. And they were they didn't arrive on time. They 
we were we were waiting, waiting, waiting. Then I went down to apologize uh, for all to all these mountain yards uh, who were there to uh, work that day and and get this. Uh, it was actually uh, a uh, small village. We were trying to move the whole thing in one day, <laughs> and uh, when I got down there, there were three elephants. And these elephants were loaded with what obviously was the roof of a house and the sideboards for a house and the and the, the pilings uh, that was, yeah. <laughs> and and the uh, the old the oldest the eldest village chief came over and I said, "How did you how did you know to bring these elephants?" to do this job, they said, this is the way we always do it. This is the way we always do it. We don't, we don't wait on Vietnamese to help us. So uh, mm. it was, uh, see, I got there, I guess it was around mid-January, something like that. And then on the 1st of February, we had our first uh, First assault, there's about 18, uh, 18 mortar rounds that hit the compound. We had uh, one, uh, and it was mostly in the vicinity of the uh, 155 uh, art artillery battery that was there in the compound. And they uh, we had one KIA, and I think it was six, six wounded in that, that little. Uh, in that little assault. And the, uh, I guess I didn't tell you about the other, uh, the other people in the compound. There was uh, two, two platoons, uh, two engineer platoons in, in, the, in the compound. The reasons the 155s were in there was to provide uh, security for the engineer platoons that were building a road going down through the district, they're going to try to link uh, Pleiku to uh, a, uh, another large city in the south of uh, south of us uh, called uh, Ban Me To It. And, uh, called what? Ban Me To It. And uh, they were the two largest cities uh, in, uh, in that provincial area. Then uh, on the night of uh, 15th of March, all hell broke loose and uh, there was mortars, artillery, rockets, everything you could name hit the compound all at the same time. And there, there was a grand assault, ground assault uh, as, as well. There's a, a regimental sized unit was in, in the district and they were launching what would, what, what we guess to be uh, company sized assault, assault. And uh, the other, uh, the other really frightening thing about the compound was the grass in the in the wire. There were there were three iterations of barbed wire around the district headquarters compound. One had been done uh, originally, whatever that was. Uh, that was uh, the uh, French years and years ago. And then uh, the Mountain Yards had, uh, had done one and the Arvin had done one. Each time there was a new circle of barbed wire, then there was a new circle of uh, uh, traps and and uh, other nasty things that were put in the ground in case anybody wanted to come through. Well, because there were three three different uh, iterations of, of wire, uh, there was you really needed to have uh, a, a a map of, of each one if you wanted to do anything. Uh, in, inside inside the wire, and, and there were no maps at all. So anything that, that was going to be done to try to improve that uh, 
the situation with the war uh, it was going to require uh, just handwork trying to make sure that there, the booby traps that might have been set or discovered and disarmed well you gotta you can imagine about how, how much work that would take and time that it would take and over over uh, the period of time that the uh, that the from the period of time that things had been put in place that barbara had put in place till the present time nothing had been done so the grass had grown up inside of that barbara to about three foot high and north north vietnamese had expert sappers that knew how, how to crawl through grass, knew how to crawl through barbed wire, knew how to cut openings in, in the barbed wire. And it was it was just enough to, to, to scare you to because you could stand almost anywhere in, in the compound, look out and not see anything. And there, there could be a, an entire squad of sappers, you know, it, would, it was that dense. And uh, there was that much cover. Anybody on their belly would be completely covered with, with that grass. You couldn't see them. Mm -hmm. So when, when things started uh, that night, it, within, uh, within the first uh, half hour to an hour of the, uh, of the artillery bombardment, uh, they were in the compound. So uh, this added another another level of uh, excitement to defending the compound. So uh, there were there was a lot done that there was a lot done that night, and we were we were really really uh, lucky. We lost. Uh, we only lost one man, one one KIA. Um, but uh, there were a lot of Arvin and uh, and mountain yards uh, didn't do as well between the two of them. I guess there was uh, just a little under a hundred of them that were uh, killed. But it wasn't all that night because the uh, the siege went on for five days. Uh, five days and the that five days we had uh, I think it was 13 assaults on the compound and the bombardment really never let up but there was a uh, there was a uh, regimental combat team our, our regimental combat team that was uh, deployed uh, the morning uh, the morning after the uh, siege had started and they were putting a lot of pressure on those those units that had uh, initially assaulted the compound, and uh, they finally broke through uh, the encirclement and uh, and they and, and the siege siege was over. Actually, we took uh, we took mortar fire for. I think it was, it was a little over 20 days, 21, 22 days in a row. And uh, that was at night. They were just harassing us. But, uh, you know, they were zeroed in and there was no problem hit, hitting uh, what they wanted to hit inside inside the compound. So uh, we had to abandon a lot of things. We had to, well, there were a lot of things done. And, that that night, a lot of Im improv work uh, was done, and, and we survived. I think I always thought that uh, everybody did a hell of a job just to, to lose one man. But that that uh, first uh, assault that we had uh, on a, around the first of February, when they they launched those. Uh, 18 mortar rounds that that actually helped us because it woke everybody up woke me up and uh 
So we started paying a lot of attention to how we were going to defend the compound if anything really big, big came in, and it came, uh, you know, just two weeks, two weeks after, uh, after that initial one. So uh, the rest of the time that we spent there uh, was just trying to uh, rebuild the district. It, it was just completely, completely torn up. And, uh, and the district chief, a miserable human being, he, uh, he stayed true to form. Because there were a lot of uh, materials start coming into the district so that we could turn that over to the mountain yards and they could rebuild their uh, their villages. There's so many of them had been you know, just blown down to the ground. And so uh, we would deliver this uh, material to to the village, take it off the trucks, and brought it in, put it on the ground, and then we'd go off to uh, pick up another load, maybe. And this one time, the interpreter said, "Go back, go back, go back." So we turned around and we went back to the place where we had just come from, and there was the chief and a bunch of bunch of his people taking all the material and they were loading it on another truck, getting ready to haul it out of there. And, and uh, I guess sell it on one of the markets. I don't know. Mm. Uh, so uh, that <laughs> that made it uh, the relationship that he and I had even that much worse because you know, I got, got caught with his fingers and in the cookies jar. Mm -hmm. Well, Ray, I'm gonna have to ask that we. I mean, it's been we've been two and a half hours now. Uh, Get out of here. yeah two and a half hours uh and and you know it's going to take me days to edit this at this point so can i just uh in the interest of kind of wrapping up can we can we kind of zoom out and talk about uh psyops since vietnam uh and and just you know how how modern technology is changing psyops and where you think psyops is headed as a practice I think the, the biggest thing that's going to happen in PSYOPs is, uh, is the use of uh, the technology that exists out there now. And you can, you can see it happening in, uh, even, in, even in the newspapers. I'm uh, presently involved in trying to uh, get some PSYOP lessons learned out of the conflict going on now with Russia and the Ukraine. And uh, I was looking at that to see what opportunities uh, the people were uh, taking advantage of. And uh, there is a wealth of, of, of PSYOP being done on both sides, but the, uh, the Ukraine seem to have a, a, a special gift for using it. The, the Russians have the tonnage and they can do an awful lot of destruction, but uh, as far as the information battle is concerned, uh, so that was his name, Selesky is winning that battle hands, hands down. Hmm. And uh, I've got uh, I had several uh, examples of that. And a lot of it's got to do, again, with uh, technology and then uh, natural, natural lead, in his case, natural leadership uh, capability. Because uh, I, I just uh, I remember writing a uh, an evaluation in one of the last submissions I made, and I said that the uh, the thing that's left after the uh, Russians drop the tonnage of of ammo is just the rubble of the schoolhouse or or hospital and where, where the, the, the rubble stands where the hospital used to stand. But as far as the people are concerned, what stands there now is a patriot who's ready to give his life 
worst country. And uh, as long as as long as people uh, and commanders have an have an appreciation for uh, what can be done with uh, proper analysis of the situation and having the uh, having the physical groundwork and that enables you to be able to do some of the things that uh, PSYOP can do. Uh, it has always, in my mind, it has, it has always been one of the things that can uh, influence the, the battlefield as much as any other uh, any other weapon that uh, a commander has at, at his hands. Now, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was talking to someone just just the other day about uh, what can what can be done to uh, demoralize the uh, Russians. Russian troops and the, the uh, Russian civilians, and I say, "Well, you you talked, you talked to them." They said, "Yeah, but they the Russians are blocking uh, all the radio transmissions, and and uh, they have uh, their own that they are are using to propagandize their people." And I said. If they uh, if they are blocking um, radio for Europe and and other stations like that, how is the message going to get through? And uh, I said, uh, "What's that guy? What's that guy's name?" Zelensky. Musk. Elon. Oh, Elon Musk! Right, right, with the satellites. Yeah, with the satellites. He moved the satellites over there where the satellites could be used to get that message in, to get the messages in, into uh, places that uh, otherwise couldn't be had. And I think that's that's what's going to happen uh, as far as uh, the application of technology is, uh, is concerned. And uh, if people do the job that they're supposed to do down at the school and carry, uh, carry the word uh, to the uh, other services. I think that the uh, continued use and continued effective use of uh, style looks, looks pretty good. Yeah, maybe. Uh... You know, maybe we haven't even hit the peak yet, right? I mean, maybe there's a psyop will be even more, even more impactful in the future than it than it has been in the past. I think it absolutely will be, and uh, there are so many things now that they can do uh, with. Uh, when, I to Try, when they're trying to gauge what. Uh, people are thinking and feeling and uh, how some of the uh, technology has been used in uh, some of the uh, voting that's taken place mm -hmm. here in this country. When we're talking about some of the uh, software that uh, that they have. And it, it's absolutely incredible the things that they can find out uh, about what <laughs> what people's motivations are. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I'm talking now about just advertising, but uh, it's just one, one step away. Right. Yeah, all that data, all that data is just sitting out there, right? Yeah, exactly. You can mine it, you can analyze it, you can find patterns, you can, uh, I mean, you can get really granular in terms of people's attitudes based on the, you know, and their behaviors, right? More importantly. Yeah, I wish I would have paid attention uh, now in the uh, math classes I had in school 
I know better what they're talking about when they're talking about logarithms. Yeah. Yeah. Man, me too. Me too. Um, 